everyone. This is the second segment of the Proterozoic chapter. Uh, I finished the first uh, segment at the uh, different ice ages during the Earth history. And actually, we are going to have to talk about this huge big ice age, which is the biggest uh, of the Earth history. Um, and it happened during the Proterozoic. Uh, we had wide, widespread glaciation and it, uh, between 900 and 600 million years ago. We have tillites and other um, glacial deposits just about everywhere. The only continent actually which didn't have any uh, glacial deposit is Antarctica. Um, of course, uh, the glaciation wasn't continuous. It had four major periods. Uh, but inside the major periods, you still have like uh, periods of warming, uh, like interglacial. So you have glacial and interglacial time. But then uh, these 300 million years actually have been divided into four major periods. Uh, most likely this glaciation was the biggest one in the Earth history. A lot of the scientists think that actually Earth was completely frozen over uh, and they call it the Snowball Earth. Uh, the Snowball Earth um, is an interesting conception. They think that life could survive possibly underneath of the ice. Like in Antarctica, they did find a huge big lake and they, they have um, like some cracks so they are able to see down to the bottom of it and it's full of life. So they think that the life might have survived uh, in those low uh, under glacial uh, water. Um, for sure, we have tillite even at the equator, so that supports the snowball earth, um, but it's possible that it never really did completely frozen over. This here is the earlier period, the uh, cryogenian, and uh, this period was going on from 730 to 700 million years ago. And these are the, the yellow dots are the sites where they did find evidence for ice rafted uh, sediment or tillite. And the red one, uh, I actually, the red dots are the BIF formation of this time. And this one here shows you the, the younger, the Marinoon glacial period, which is uh, even more widespread, as you can see, with probably a little bit less BIF formation. But but for sure, the Ice Age was amazing. It's huge. Um, you can find the tillite everywhere on Earth. And remember, this Ice Age was like 300 million years long. So it's really, really long. Um, after this ice age, uh, we're going to have to talk about the atmosphere and how did it change. Um, remember, we have talked about that the photosynthesizing cyanobacteria uh, produced oxygen by 2.5, 1.8 billion years ago, and there was enough oxygen in the atmosphere to start the ozone formation. As you have oxygen, in the atmosphere. The oxygen usually and O2, which means covalently bounded diatomic molecules. These are like nitrogen, hydrogen, those are all diatomic molecules. They they all are covalently bounded and it's pretty uh, stable oxygen molecules, just like hydrogen and nitrogen. Uh, but but if the UV radiation hits it in the upper atmosphere, and I put down too so you can actually see how it forms, uh, so the UV radiation hits the oxygen molecule and actually changes into a very, very reactive oxygen atom plus the ozone molecules. The ozone molecules is an O3 molecule. Now, what we know about both, both of these, that the oxygen and the ozone are extremely reactive, and that's why we have all the BIF, the banded iron formation of this time, because this very, very reactive oxygen reacted with the iron and, and made uh, iron oxide all over the world. Uh, the as soon as the ozone layer become established, 
in the upper atmosphere, actually the ultraviolet radiation couldn't reach the Earth anymore. So oxygen, the diatomic molecule, become the, the primary source of uh, surface oxidation. And on this side is actually the, the photosynthesis. And you remember uh, that the plants need CO2 and water and uh, energy from the sunlight, and they will make uh, sugar. That's what they eat, basically. This is sugar. And this is how the free oxygen forms. That's why it's so important that in your bedroom you will have uh, a plant and that's the best uh, body to sleep with because they actually give you the oxygen. If you sleep with somebody else, that person only takes away your oxygen and doesn't give you any. Actually, it sucks up, that person sucks up your oxygen. So kick that person out and put some plants in the room. Just kidding. Now, I wanted to tell you one more thing. The, one, the, the thing is that like, if you live in a big city, huge big city, or you, the area is like in a in a valley or something, then uh, actually from the gas, the exhaust gas from the cars, which is uh, SO2 and that kind of gases, they will actually react with the diatomic oxygen molecule and can break it up into O and uh, O3 ozone. The near surface ozone is very, very harmful for us actually. It causes a lot of allergy and this is what we call smog. Very many people have problems uh, breathing in the smog. So if you didn't know it until now, it, you do now. So that's good. Now this slide shows you the, the evolution basically. Uh, here is the, the beginning of the earth and then the, the outcasting right here and after the uh, outgassing the stromatolites are producing their oxygen um, and they have been producing it and when we had enough oxygen that's when the uh, eukaryotes coming around and then the multicellular life right here and then it's today so let's get into the life. Let's talk about the fossil record. At the beginning, we definitely have had inherited archaean life. Mostly uh, the stromatolites stayed still, and they were, of course, anaerobic prokaryotes because they didn't need oxygen to produce food. They actually use CO2, you know, photosynthesis. Um, and this is a very typical... Uh, stromatolite. These are under uh, water stromatolites. They're making these so-called stromatolite heads. Now, during the early Proterozoic, we really ha could see, uh, and the Archean, we could see the lack of organic diversity. Um, and one of the reasons is because the stromatolites are uh, asexual. And when something is uh, reproducing asexually, um, they don't really have any way to, to have variation because uh, this is just uh, two cells becomes one cell becomes two cells and they're exactly the same. Uh, the only way you can have variation if you have sexually reproducing uh, population where you have shuffling of the gain, genes and their alleles from generation to, to generation. Also the sexually uh, reproducing organisms can have a lot of mutation and uh, could be possibly some mutation in the prokaryotes, but, but their effects are very, very limited. The asexual reproduction is not the best way to, to, to do evolution, to see evolution happening. So don't worry about you feeling that you want to have sex because it's built in you because uh, evolution is only possible by sexual uh, reproduction.
if if we have genetic variation uh, in sexually reproducing organisms, the beneficial mutation spreads pretty uh, rapidly, especially if it's a one-celled organism such as bacteria. Uh, The bacteria does not change actually genes with with another bacteria. Uh, they do uh, reproduce by binary fission because they do have uh, the same genetic makeup. Uh, there are some conditions where actually they can engage in conjugation during which some genetic material can be transferred. So that's how they can actually change. As soon as the sexual reprodu reproduction came into account, the evolution uh, really uh, speeded up big time. Uh, before the sexual reproduction happened, uh, evolution was a very, very slow process. So therefore, that accounts for the very low organic diversity. Uh, However, this situation didn't uh, persist because the sexually re reproducing cells probably evolved during the early Proterozoic time, and thereafter the evolution really speeded up. Now, what is the possibility of the uh, eukaryotic cell? Of course, you don't really know, but there are a couple of uh, hypotheses. Uh, one is like two prokaryotic cell. Uh, unite uh, and right here you can see the one which is from bacteria and this is from the cyanobacteria the cyanobacteria would produce the plants most likely and the bacteria would produce the animals that's another one the for the evolution of eukaryotes the endosymbiotic hypothesis of course I will not ask these things you know like just understand that in the archaean, we had the prokaryotic cells, they reproduced asexually, so there was not much genetic variability, so they didn't really evolve, they're still the same. And then in the early Proterozoic, we, we uh, start seeing eukaryotic cells, and they actually have mitochondria, they have nucleus, and they actually can, um, they reproduce sexually, so evolution starts and it speeds up really quickly. So these are the important thing you got to know. So eukaryotes. Uh, the first ones, uh, the first eukaryotic cell which become fossil is about 1.6 billion years ago. They still, uh, these large cells are still around. We have the molecular fossils, the sterines and the acritarch which is planktonic algae. So basically, algae was the first uh, eukaryotic uh, fossil. Uh, they are planktonic algae, and uh, th their maximum age, so the earliest fossil is about 1.6 billion years ago, and you can find them in Russia, California, Australia, and Greenland. The eukaryotic protozoans have like vase-shaped fossils, uh, we can find them in Arizona and the Spitsbergen. And then the metazoans, they, they, the most well-known ones are the uh, Adiacaran fauna from Australia. But we do have some from China and Russia. Uh, some of these might not have modern equivalents. And I have a picture of the, uh, I have a picture of the acritarch. Uh, this one is the primitive version, and this is the more evolved one. Uh, it's a 3D picture, so it looks really, really good. And this uh, this is the location of the Adiacaran fauna. This is the rocks, how they look like. Adiacaran fauna is amazing because they are soft-bodied soft animals, and these are their impressions. So to, to save this, the impressions, uh, 
like a, a volcanic ash or something had to fall down on the on the fossils and and they couldn't do anything so therefore that impressions got preserved um this is how these guys looked like and the sea at the time must have been looking like this Uh, we have three present-day phyla possibly present. Uh, one of in the Ediacaran fauna. One of them is most likely the the jellyfish and sea pens, and the other ones are segmented worms. Uh, and the third kind is the the primitive members of the arthropods. And there is a, a Adiacaran fossil, the Sprigina, Sprigina uh, and they think that it might be the ancestor of the trilobites. Uh, another might be a primitive member of echinoderms. The, we have some other proterozoic animal fossils, all, although very rare. A few uh, older animal pass, uh, fossil could be present. We have jellyfish-like impressions, uh, 2,000 meters below Adiakara Hills. Um, there are some burrows in many areas, probably made by worms. And these rocks where these worms occurred about 700 million years old. And we have some worm-like algae fossil which is from seven to nine hundred million years ago from China, uh, but they are not sure that it's really that kind of fossil. But they definitely look like. So here we have the a summary figure of the early animal diversification. Uh, the blue line shows you the divergence times, like right here, see, right here. These are the divergence times. Everybody talking about the Cambrian explosion, they said that there was nothing and boom, there was everything, like right here. You can see that most every um, phylum is present. But really, if you, if you look at the uh, invertebrate calibrated molecular sequence an analysis, you can see that these animals have started much earlier, right, right, right at the end of the Ice Age. Now, Im imagine if the if the Earth was in an ice age, then uh, especially if it was really the the snowball Earth. I mean, very few living things could have survived unless they were under the water, um, and they must have been very very primitive because this ice age was just never ending. So, as you can see, that uh, life have started much before the the. Uh, the Cambrian, and it's like going back to 600, uh, 645, 645 million years to probably, so it's, it's more than 100 million years. So it's a whole lot of long time. It's a bit different than what people are saying about the Cambrian explosion, that they think it's like almost no time, and boom, from nothing we have everything. But in real life, just think about what happens is that uh, oxygen level getting up high, ice age. So it's really hard. But then when the ice age ends, the whole earth becomes like a, a really good place to be. And we have the um, oxygen level and then the life starts exploding. Actually, we have this plankton plankton explosion which is like really the the eukaryotic cell and then after that evolution happens really really fast so it's pretty cool I hope you understand this and this slide shows you the the resources of the proterozoic we have a whole lot of iron and that is from the uh, the iron formation the banded iron formation of course and it it's everywhere, but in the U.S. and uh, Canada, we have really large deposits. We have a lot of nickel, which is related to that uh, middle proterozoic igneous activity, and we have a lot of it in, 
in the Sudbury district in Canada. And we have a lot of uh, platinum and chromium also related to this igneous activity, more, mostly in the bushveld complex in, in uh, Africa. We also have pegmatites. Pegmatites, if you have pegmatites, like usually in, it's in a batholith, which is a huge, big granite. And inside the granite, you got, you got like veins uh, with huge, big crystals. And that forms at the end of the crystallization. And only the minerals, which still have some liquid phase, are forming in these veins. And, um, and a lot of the times you can find uh, mostly gemstones and very rare elements, which couldn't crystallize during the main crystallization because it didn't have enough um, elements. So it had to wait until everything else crystallized. And that's when they become like more plentiful in the remaining uh, liquid, relatively, of course. So you will find them in the so-called pegmatites. Um, so most of the the most important pegmatite minerals are actually the the gemstones, and we have a lot of it in Maine. Okay, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the early Paleozoics. Bye.